Hello, Dorothy. I am coming for you. Dorothy Jane Scott, born on April 23, 1948, was a single mother living in Stanton, California, with her aunt and her four-year-old son. She was a secretary for two jointly owned Anaheim stores, one that sold psychedelic items, and the other a retail outlet, specializing in paraphernalia used for consumption of cannabis and tobacco. Co-workers and friends said she preferred staying at home, was a devout Christian, and did not drink or do drugs. The father of her four-year-old son Sean did not live locally, so it was her parents that babysat their grandson while she worked. Jacob, Dorothy's father, said his daughter may have dated on occasion but had no steady boyfriend, as far as the family knew. Months before her abduction, Scott had begun receiving strange phone calls at work from an unknown male. Dorothy herself often remarked that the male voice on the other end of the line seemed familiar to her, yet she never found out who exactly these calls were from. The caller alternately told of his love for her, and at other times, his intent to kill her. Vera, her mother recalled. That day he called and said to go outside because he had something for her. She went out, and there was a single dead red rose on the windshield of her car. She also said one call especially horrified her daughter. The man reportedly told Scott he would get her alone and cut her up into bits so no one will ever find her. The disembodied voice threatened and tormented her often, and because of the calls, Dorothy began considering the purchase of a handgun. About a week before her disappearance, she started taking karate lessons. He was calling her almost every day, that was forcing police to take the extreme measure of installing an early voice recorder on Dorothy's phone. The man always warned that he was watching her at all times. Back in 1980s, there was far less awareness of stalking and the danger such behavior poses, how it can escalate and build up to murder. Often, stalking is not taken as seriously as it should be. Today, there is much more research and understanding of stalkers and how their behaviors manifest. There is also vastly more knowledge also about how many women who are murdered have been stalked by their killer beforehand. Dorothy Stalker was not known to be an ex-partner or an individual she had been in any form of relationship with. This man however was able to watch her, follow her, and note her movements, her clothes, her location, all without seemingly raising suspicions by those around him or being spotted by Dorothy herself. His phone calls suggest he had an obsession with Dorothy. He was in love with her. Obsession and fixation are key features of stalking behaviors and also the principal red flags for how much of a danger this stalker may be. People characterized as stalkers may be accused of having a mistaken belief that another person loves them, or that they need rescuing. On May 28, 1980, Dorothy Scott was at an employee meeting at work. She noted a co-worker named Conrad Bostrin did not look well and had a red mark on his arm. She and another co-worker, Pam Head, left the employee meeting to take Bostrin to the emergency room. On the way to the hospital, they stopped by Dorothy's parents' house to check on her son. She also changed her black scarf to a red one. At the hospital, medical personnel determined Bostrin had suffered a black widow spider bite and treated him. Pam said she and Dorothy remained in the waiting room. At no time did Dorothy leave her side, Pam said. Conrad was discharged around 11 p.m. and given a prescription. Dorothy offered to bring her car to the exit. She did not want Conrad to walk too far in his condition, as he was still not feeling well. Pam said that Dorothy used the restroom briefly before heading out to the parking lot. Conrad and Pam filled his prescription and waited at the exit for Dorothy. When they did not see her after a few minutes, they went out to the parking lot. Suddenly, they saw Dorothy's car speeding toward them. Its headlights blinded them so they could not see who was behind the wheel. They waved their arms to try to get Dorothy's attention. But the car sped past them and took a sharp right turn out of the parking lot. Initially, both thought Dorothy had an emergency come up with her son. A few hours later, 
After not hearing from her, Pam and Conrad reported Dorothy missing. At about 4.30 a.m., on May 29th, the car, a white 1973 Toyota station wagon, was found burning in an alley about 10 miles from the hospital. Neither she, nor her supposed kidnapper were anywhere nearby. Two weeks after Dorothy vanished, her mystery caller found a new conversation partner. Are you related to Dorothy Scott? He first asked Dorothy's mother. Well, I've got her. From then on, every Wednesday, Whilst Dorothy's mother Vera was alone in the house, the phone would ring. According to Vera, the caller actually knew specific chilling details about Dorothy. He even knew what color her final scarf was. Was this caller really Dorothy's killer? The same man who had been taunting Dorothy down the phone for so many months. The police insisted that her parents revealed nothing in the press to compromise the case until Jacob cracked and contacted the local paper the Orange County Register to tell them about his daughter's case. The article on Dorothy's disappearance was published on June 12, 1980. The same day this piece came out, the editor, Pat Riley, received a phone call as well. The male voice on the other end informed the editor. I killed her. I killed Dorothy Scott. She was my love. I caught her cheating with another man. In addition, the caller provided details that only the responsible party would know, information that was deliberately withheld from the public, like the fact that she'd been wearing a red scarf and the reason for her visit to the hospital. The man on the phone knew about the spider bite and said that Dorothy had called him from there. According to those who knew her best, Dorothy wasn't dating anyone at the time. These calls continued for four years, haunting the lives of Dorothy's parents. This was until April 1984 when Jacob, Dorothy's father, answered the phone. On hearing Jacob's voice the caller immediately hung up and didn't call back again for four months. Was the caller worried Dorothy's father would recognize his voice? On August 6, 1984, a construction worker discovered dog and human bones side by side, about 30 feet from Santa Ana Canyon Road. The bones were partly charred and authorities believed they had been there for two years as a bushfire had swept across the site in 1982. A turquoise ring and watch were also found. Dorothy's mother said the watch had stopped at 12.30 a.m. on the 29, about an hour after Pam and Conrad last saw Scott's vehicle. On August 14th, the bones were identified by dental records. An autopsy could not determine the cause of death. After her remains were found in August 1984, the family started receiving calls again. Police installed a voice recorder at the Scott residence. They were not able to trace the calls, however, because the man never stayed on the line long enough. Customers to the head shop where Dorothy had worked were investigated. Yet, as she had worked in the office, she had little to do with the often odd people that frequented the shop where she worked. The only lead was the caller, and although the police tried to trace the calls, the phone was always hung up before they could find out where the calls were coming from. Although her remains were found after four years from her disappearance, and the family gained some form of closure, the mystery of her death continued, becoming a cold case by this time. The investigators still struggled to come up with a clear timeline of the events. They were puzzled about the dog's remains found together with those of Dorothy, and could not decide if it was just a coincidence being found together, or if the animal remains were connected to Dorothy's death. During the years, some theories surged about who was responsible for Dorothy's death. Some have suggested a suspect called Mike Butler, who lived in the local hills. Dorothy's son became aware of Mike through some of her old friends in Missouri. Mike knew Dorothy through his sister, who also worked at the shop and, according to those who knew Dorothy, he was obsessed with her. Mike passed away from health complications in 2014. He was a writer who was often published in Stars and Stripes News. After graduating from Fullerton Union High School in the early 1960s, he attended California State University, majoring in English. At the age of 20, he was drafted into the U.S. Army. Mike lived around the Santiago Mountains and was known to be very unstable and involved in cult activities. 
law enforcement was well aware of him, but did not have sufficient evidence to take action. Mike's sister is still alive and is a well-known local singer in Orange County and Los Angeles. Dorothy's son has made several unsuccessful attempts to speak with her. As Jacob was a familiar presence around the shop, Mike most likely crossed paths with him and knew he was Dorothy's father. Supporters of this theory believe that whoever killed Dorothy followed her to the hospital and probably waited in the parking lot in the hopes that she might emerge by herself. Enraged that he saw her in the presence of a man, Conrad, he confronted her when she went outside to retrieve her car. His delusion led him to believe he had a relationship with her, and by being in the presence of another man, she was being unfaithful to him. Frightened and confused, she would have explained that she brought a co-worker to the hospital because of a spider bite, but things quickly escalated. Whether he disabled her, threw her into the vehicle and drove it away himself or threatened her to get behind the wheel and drive, only he would know. As previously mentioned, Pam and Conrad were unable to distinguish who was behind the wheel, as they were blinded by the headlights. Dorothy's family held a memorial service on August 22, 1984, her parents finally able to lay their daughter to rest. Haunted for years by a cold-blooded caller, Dorothy's parents never knew who killed their child. Jacob Scott died in 1994. Dorothy's mother Vera passed away in 2002. The phone calls that tormented Dorothy's grieving parents were taunting and cruel. Dorothy's son has grown up without ever knowing what happened to his mother or why. This unknown stalker, who had terrorized Dorothy in the months before he abducted and murdered her, is, or at least it was for a long time still out there. An individual who has never faced justice for taking an innocent life and leaving behind devastating grief and a lifetime of unanswered questions.